Yeah. Thank you both for being here. Um, as Steve, before the screening, I, I love your stories about discovering Mifune for the first time growing up in LA. Um, Tara, I wonder if you, you could actually talk about your first experiences with Mifune. Because you remember from my Facebook post. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually um, was in high school uh, and I was going through this very anti Japanese phase. I was born and raised in the U.S. and um, I was growing up in uh, Torrance, California, and you know, I would have to go to Japanese school every Saturday, and uh, all my friends were not having to go to Japanese school. Or go to, you know, they were having fun on Saturdays, and I had to, and they would always say, well, in Japan you would have to do this, and then I would rebel and say, no, I'm, not. I'm American, and they would say, you're Japanese and American. So I went through this anti-Japanese phase, and for some reason I went to Blockbuster and rented Seven Samurai from the foreign language section. I don't know why, um, it just looked interesting to me. And it was three and a half hours long. I didn't know that going in, but I was absolutely, <laughs> um, I was absolutely taken by the film. It didn't feel that long. It was, you know, to that time, probably even now, my favorite film today. And, uh, and then I started watching all these different Kurosawa and Mifune films. I think I went to Yojimbo next, and you know, all the films that you see in here. And uh, that got me to reevaluate my relationship with Japan. So that's why Mifune and Kurosawa both have a special place for me. Yeah, so I'm wondering, I mean, so much of the film is, is Mifune plus Kurosawa. Was it tough to not make a movie about both of them as opposed to just about Mifune? Uh, well, you know, plenty of work to just in Mifune. And yeah, I mean, Kurosawa, they're inexplicably, they're, they're, you know, they're like that, you can't imagine one with the other. And uh, I mean, it's like John Ford and John Wayne, they you can't imagine films. But um, it was, it was uh, you know, from the, enough of the challenge, and we were, you know, sort of, um, sort of had limitations, you know, that we had to deal with. And so, you know, it, uh, and Mifune's family was, you know, very big part of the production, and we wanted, you know, to, for it to be about him. And, uh, and then I think if it was clearly about the two of them, then you would have have that question of why they split, which you know no one really had, you know no one there's not a definitive version, and but not not no definitive version came out of their mouths as far as we can tell. Well, it seemed like when I was watching it, it wasn't just that there was no definitive version. It's almost like nobody even wanted to say any rumors. Well, Japanese, as you know, are very polite and. Uh, and you can see in the film, the uh, actress Yoko Tsukasa is just trying to say that the food on the location was bad, and she, she won't even do that. She goes, well, <laughs> it was not great, you know. But, uh, so, uh, you know, for Japanese culture to, you know, I, you know, I, I was surprised that they, for some reason, if you're drunk, you can talk about how someone behaves somehow. <laughs> so they were all happy to talk about Mifune getting drunk. Uh, but um, I think that you know that relationship was very private and very unspoken. Um, you know, and really, you know, they Kurosawa was focused on all the other aspects and really did leave Mifune to to just play his character. And so I, you know, I'm sure that I, you know, there were there was tension building up through. Red beer, but you know there was nothing, you know. But it, it, I think it was just a lot of things. And as Scorsese says in the film, you know, sixteen films. They made sixteen films together. That's a lot, and you know, that's an extraordinary collaboration. And and you know, someone gets on your nerves after sixteen films. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly, to the very end, you can't see it on screen. But it seems like that collaboration is, is solid. <laughs> yeah. Although with Red Beard, you can see them moving in the younger actor. Um, Kayama, and that clearly there's some, even though he has Mifune playing a character older than, 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 he, he, you know, than he is, you can see the, you know, the changing right there in the film. The younger actor has much more screen time. Um, and, you know, and, and, and the industry was just changing. TV was coming in, and Japanese movies were, you know, had to be, you know, uh, you know, many few, you know, they were the people, you know, went, went to the movies religiously until TV came in. And, um, but you know, I, I don't, to me the most touching thing is that uh, that same, the same actress, uh, Yoko Tsukasa, 
you know, she says, you know, that was the end of their relationship, and then you can hear it in her voice that nostalgia, she said, and it, it was kind of the end of, it was the end for all of us, you know. And uh, the powerful thing about doing the film is having that sense of these people that were roughly around the same age, the cast, the crew people, the, you know, the set designers, they were all kind of around the same age, trying, and they rebuilt the Japanese, you know, coming out of the war, dirt poor, and they rebuilt this industry together, and there was really, you know, at Telpo and, and I'm sure at the other studios, this camaraderie, you know. And they were, you know, they all worked on each other's films and, you know, and, and the lower people, you know. I mean, the, the young woman in Redbeard was like an extra on Seven Sunrise. She was playing one of the little children that run around in the village. Yeah, so I mean, like, uh, as you're saying, I mean, the film doesn't, one of the things that's, that's most impressive about the film to me is it's not just about a person. It's almost, it's also about Japanese cinema and so many changes that have uh, happened to it from the lens of one person who kind of was there from, from early stages. Um, how, how, what was that challenge like, trying to have to contextualize this career within Japanese cinema and its, and its mutations? Um, well, that's way too intellectual for me. <laughs> uh, I just try to uh, go from here to there. I mean, the, the one thing I did really want to inject was um, the silent films and sort of establish. I mean, you know, there's a temptation to really make your themes, you know, and really hit your marks on it, but it just seemed really un Japanese to do that to me. And so, you know, we sort of lay in things and and I really wanted to sort of establish that loner thing that happened, you know, from the earliest samurai films. And, you know, the, the one we show, the longest piece of Chopin, is just an extraordinary film, you know. And then it's like, uh, I had this working title in my head when we started, which was One Against Many. And just, you know, the, the, it, the samurai is a sort of symbol for individualism. And, uh, you know, samurai could be a symbol for a lot of things, but you know, for nationalism, or, but, it, but it's really, Samurai is really against the grain of Japanese society. I mean, you know, the Japanese are to fit in and not to stand out like that. And uh, in those old silent films, it's just amazing. You know, they, they really just keep, their enemies keep coming, keep coming, and the, you know, that extraordinary thing where he licks the blood off his sword. And, uh, and then, you know, in the, in, typically in the other ones, you know, the guy's fighting with his sword and then he, you know, he loses his sword, or bra it breaks, and he grabs a stick, and he's fighting with that, and then, you know, then he's got a twig, and finally, they're always, they're always vanquished, because in Jap one rule in Japanese society is that the individual can't really win, and so always in those, typical ending of those films is they finally, after killing, fighting a thousand guys, they finally, you know, in that film, they lasso them, they sort of take them away, and and it fades out, and uh, you know you see the you see the woman he really loves standing there with his best friend, and they're going, and uh, and then you you know that the samurai, and sometimes you see it, the the samurai has been executed in some way. Uh, in that film, the samurai you see it fades up, and he's on a cross in silhouette. Um, it's something they I guess learned from the the Dutch missionaries or something, that symbolism. Um, but, but Mifune does not, you know, does not get, it was an extraordinary thing in the Kurosawa films, the samurai is not vanquished. The samurai walks off in the sunset like a good western. Uh, is that one of the things that most attracted you to the film? And because as Japanese Americans, the fact that there was something kind of western about these films, did that make it easier for, for you as, a, as an American to, to swallow? Well, I think yeah, that is the appeal of the Samurai films, eh? and, and you know, and, and Spielberg talks about that that connection, that you know, that epic kind of Western feel, and that that classic kind of story. Um, you know, it's just uh, for me, it's just you know, I don't know that I went to it consciously about what what I want to explore beyond. Oh boy, I get to make a film about Toshiro Mifune and watch a lot of Samurai films. So, what's your relationship? Oh, did you want to? Well, I actually, in the process of kind of developing the film and editing it, when we were doing the whole silent film section, I would give them all this information, like, why don't we do this and, you know, put in The Thief of Baghdad, which also influenced, you know, the Changwara movies and do this and do that. And, and then I quickly realized that for him, that's just too academic. You can do that in books, you can read about them, but in a movie, 
you had to have a compelling story, and the story was, you know, how to tell the story of Mifune and the, the samurai spirit that he had. And the samurai, like you kind of mentioned, can be interpreted in different ways. It could be about, you know, um, absolute loyalty to a master, or it could be this rebellious spirit that's often shown in the movies. And I think Mifune was clearly the latter, and that's what he wanted to show in that section. And it took me some time to realize that uh, a lot of the ideas that I was coming up would be much more for like a book, you know. And, and I think that's something that I realized about um, Stephen's filmmaking when we were doing White Light, Black Rain too. There was, you know, he had to tell a very clear story that would really, you know, grab the audience. And I hope, you know, you were able to get that from this Mifune documentary too. And it helps to have great visuals and great clips. Can you talk about some of the challenges of acquiring those clips? And making sure that they're in, they're in this film to keep it a visual experience? Well, I just kind of sigh and roll my eyes at that question. I can't have to do this. It was very difficult to argue with David. Well, um, you know, these things are all copyrighted. So um, as most filmmakers here will probably know, when you, whenever you do these things, you need to license them. And uh, Japan is not known to be cheap when it comes to these things. So we, we had to work with the challenges of the clips not being cheap, but I think Stephen was able to come up with um, a structure for the film where we did have to sort of focus on a certain number of films and it made sense to kind of focus on the samurai movies. But, well, the, yeah. the telling thing is they're, they're, you know, after all this time, um, you know, Russian was made in 1950, after all this time they're, you know, as soon as, uh, as soon as they said, you know, I, I could do the film, you know, I Googled it, or I forget, maybe it was right before I, you know, I met with them. I Googled it, and there was, I was shocked. There was no Mifune comprehensive or ambitious uh, film about either Kurosawa or Mifune. There were some things with some clips, and there was kind of a sort of bootleggy something that someone had sort of pieced together, but there was nothing, and, and that, that's a shock. I mean, I'm constantly thinking, oh, this would be, the great, you know, here's an obscure blues musician, you know, and then you Google them and they're, you know, it says in production or um, just play this festival and stuff. It's, you know, the ideas are always taken and there's, there's a reason there was, I mean, this was uh, just the behind the scenes stuff was very difficult and yeah, and there's a, um, so it, it, the people in Tokyo really were behind the film, the Mifune family, they, people made it happen. I mean, I feel like there's so many other documentaries you can make about Mufuni. There's so many different angles to his life, and you could have focused on the scandals or his stardom. But what I love about the films, you focused on him as an actor. Uh, can you talk about why you wanted to do that? Well, you know, for me, I think any, any film, I try not to have... I mean, I have some things I'm sort of excited to try, but as soon as they don't work, I, I, you know, I'll move in a downward direction. And with this, I mean, you just... It's based... The whole film and the feeling of the film is based on the, the, the story that the actors and his colleagues present. And you, know, you want to go with that tone and respect that tone. And that's what you have to work with. I mean, I, you know, you try not to go in and say, OK, this would be good for this person to say this kind of thing. You just sort of discover the story. That's the fun of doing a documentary. It's discovering what the film ought to be from the people involved in it. And so I don't, you know, there was lots of stuff, like, like you were saying about the Western, you know, I just, before I started, I, you know, I, I watched a lot of, you know, the early Westerns and thought about connecting um, Kurosawa with John Ford, they both influenced each other, talking more about Mifune's, what influenced him, even from the American Westerns, the earliest Westerns of, you know, Thomas Hart and, uh, is that his name? Um, and then Mifune's influence on Westerns in general. I mean, if you, I just saw a Paul Newman film, Ombre, and I was just taken aback how Mifune asked his performances. And, uh, you know, and, Port, and Newman actually did a remake of Rashomon, a film called The Outrage, not a kind of weird film, but, um, and that, how, yeah, as you were saying, how much they, you know, influence. Uh, what we see now, uh, you know, and, you know, and, um, and how young people, you know, are hardly aware, well, they're, you know, young people are hardly aware of 
you know, of John Wayne. I mean, you can, uh, you know, people go, everything's on Netflix, you know, not, you know, the, the great, you know, swath of film, with the great film history, you know, film history is not on Netflix. It's, and you have, and so that, you know, was big impetus for doing a film was just, you know, um, remind people how enjoyable and great this stuff, this stuff is. Um, I'd love to open it up to the audience, and also like, feel free to talk about your first experiences with Mufune, or like, like what Mufune meant to you. I'd love to hear from the audience as well. Yeah. How long did it take you from like, let's make this film, to when you actually were done? Um, when the, the first meetings were in 2014, um, and I, I normally I. You know, I I, I work pretty fast. I would, you know, on average, I take about a year to do a film. But we were un we were not sure about how the licensing would be, and there was from the day everyone said let's do it, we were it was not clear that we could get to use the clips and stuff. And so that I think took six to nine months. And in the meantime, I had to work, and so I I I work with HBO a lot. And so I took a project with them. Um, uh, film that was on that's on HBO. It's called uh, Heroin Cape Cod, and so I was in Cape Cod following heroin addicts and going over to Tokyo. And so, so the two films took basically three years to make. Um, but I would say if we had not had any, well, also a big hold up was, I mean, uh, when we when we finally when we got a hold of Spielberg and Scorsese. You know, they were happy, you know, they just immediately said, yes, we want to be part of it. But getting to them and then waiting for their schedules to open, I think we, we sat around for months uh, just waiting, <coughs> basically a finished film that, you know, that we then cut them into. And so if everything had gone smoothly, it would have been short. And, um, but, you know, I, uh, you know, I, looking back, you know, the following the heroin addicts was kind of easier than dealing with the uh, licensing. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, right here. Um, there was a part where Scorsese was talking about the relationship between uh, Kurosawa and Mifune, and I was wondering, it almost sounded like he was talking about him De Niro. Did he mention anything like that? Or uh, well, no, yeah, I think it's clearly he was talking about. Uh, he's speaking from experience, and he's clearly talking about the era, but he didn't talk about it directly. And uh, we had a real, the interview was really fast, and uh, so we didn't go to do a lot of follow-ups. We had a list of questions that we got through. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think clearly that's who he's talking about. There's another question? Yeah. Can you talk about the challenges in finding the historical footage and the pictures? Because it seems that when they were making movies back in the 50s, 60s, and even the 70s, that they weren't planning on making documentaries. So how did you find those pictures of Mifune and Kurosawa together? Well, I think Kurosawa was a huge, you know, very famous director. So their productions were always very well documented. And um, so the availability of those stills were never a problem. Um, there were a bunch that Mifuni Productions had on their own, and I also went to Toho Studios, and they had a huge archive. So you see all these, you know, not quite contact sheets, you see all these small little photos, and you pick the ones you want, and they send it to you. Um, so there's actually quite a few of those. Um, uh, there's a big archive that you can draw from. And as for the films, the Kurosawa Mifune films that are obviously available, um, the harder things were kind of finding the silent films for the Chambara section because um, during the war a lot of those were kind of burned. Um, a lot of the old uh, film prints were just not well uh, preserved. So what you see are some of the really rare uh, silent films that I think you pointed out as some of your favorites now. Well, I think that you know, there's a sort of cliche sort of you know, sort of idea of Japanese revering their past and their heritage, but I, I find it not to be really true. I mean, especially when it turns to preserving things. I mean, it's a, it's a large part. It's a wood and paper culture, and so those things don't don't last. And you know, and, and I think in some ways film was treated the same way. 
where people just did not, you know, didn't take any care of storing things. Of course, the war, you know, destroyed much of the, the pre-war films, of the silent era films, and much of the stuff that's found is found in like European theaters where they sent the print out, you know, um, the Chocon, I think, was found in Belgium in a movie theater, and they, it was too much trouble to then, then send the film back. Uh, recently, an Ozu film popped up in a, in a European, uh, um, some, art, some, some source, and so, the, sadly, you know, the Japanese studios um, don't really treasure, you know, their, the legacy of all their old films the way I think the, the, the outside world and people that love cinema do. I mean, that you, if you, often if you see the, you buy a DVD or a Blu-ray there, the, the mastering the, of the imagery is really inferior to what you might get from Criterion in the United States, <coughs> you might see. A, so we, we used uh, our, from, for our clips, we used the, the first cell phones that were remastered by, in New York, by Criterion. Any other questions? Yeah, right there. Why Keanu Reeves? Why do you ask that? <laughs> I'm a fan, I've oh. been a fan for a long time. Um, cause we, you know, because we were huge fans of Bill, uh, Bill and Ted, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Taro worked with Keanu on, a. Uh, on uh, Keanu's uh, film in China, and uh, he mentioned, uh, he said what about Keanu early on, and I just sort of went, huh. And, uh, but then it started, it's, then I started thinking about other people, and I just thought, you know, wow, that, you know, I didn't want a New York accent or a Southern accent, or, and, um, and I was also, I, you know, I knew if we had a movie star as the narrator, we'd be really limited in terms of studio time, and that getting the Japanese names right would be, you know, a major issue. And you know, some people just never get them right. And I, I just thought, um, you know, and I talked to Taro about it that Keanu could probably pull that off. And I, you know, I, I, there was a nice everyman kind of quality about Keanu that remi reminded me of Mifune. You know, Mifune. Everyone who knew him in his later <coughs> years talks about seeing him cleaning up the ashtrays um, and sweeping the parking lot. You know, Keanu's and, and not having, you know, assistants and agents around him. And, you know, Keanu moves around you know, on a motorcycle and just shows up. I've never seen anyone that's that level without handlers and agents and stuff. And you, we gave him the release. I was shocked. He just said, sure. And, and, uh, <laughs> so that, there was that, there was that. And I said, I, you know, and you give it a try. And, um, and see if it works. And uh, you know, before that, otherwise it would have had been, I don't know, me or something doing it. <laughs> when um, I was in China, it was 2012, and a, he directed the film, it was called Man of Tai Chi, it's a kung fu film. And he had just come off shooting 47 Ronin. And initially they were actually toying with the idea of doing Japanese dialogue, I think. And so he had to memorize all his lines, in, not just English, but also Japanese, and he had a dialogue coach. And so his Japanese pronunci pronunciation was pretty good. Um, one day I showed up to set in the morning. He was looking groggy, but he comes up and he says, Ohio, which means good morning in Japanese. And it sounded so perfect that I remember thinking, you know, if you need, um, you know, somebody to kind of pull off that Japanese pronunciation, well, you know, he might be the one. And like Stephen said, on set, he was the kind of guy that just never had any entourage around. Um, he always cared for... Uh, the people around him. Um, at one point, um, uh, I was married at the time, and three weeks after my wedding, I had to go to uh, uh, Beijing to work on this movie for like half a year. And he knew that, so he was asking about my wife, and when I told him that um, I'm not gonna be able to see her for another half hour, he's like, uh, half, half a year, he said, uh, just fly, you know, fly her over. And I said, we're trying to save up for a honeymoon. And he's like, I'll pay for it, just bring her over. I don't know too many stars that would, you know, just without even thinking, he would just offer that. And there's a certain generosity and a certain caring for the staff and the crew and to never kind of act like a star. And I remember thinking as we were doing research for Mifune and talking to so many of the, uh, these people about their experience with Mifune, that seemed to come across that he was never 
pretending to be like this bigger star, like he was more special than anybody else. And I think that spirit um, I felt with Keanu as well. We've got time for one more question in here. Yeah. So I know like uh, George Lucas named his theater after Kurosawa at USC. So was there any was there any consideration for reaching out to Lucas or did you try? Uh, no, we did. I mean, I when I originally talked to the producers, I said, you know, I live I'm in, I live in Berkeley, so Coppola and Lucas are right there, so we could get them. And they were really I don't know I have no idea why because I just talked with their assistants or emailed with their assistants. They, you know, they said they're neither of them are that busy, and uh, <laughs> and they somehow just kept saying they couldn't do it and they could, they, they, you know, they they couldn't do their schedule. I, I don't know what their discomfort was. I mean, you know, Lucas built his career, you know, on a you know, a big his most lucrative part of his career on a Kurosawa and Mifune movie, and uh, and Coppola's. You know, from things I've seen and heard him on, it was really artic was really articulate about you know Kurosawa as a director and stuff. And so I, I thought I thought it'd be interesting. But they, so they they were the first people we asked, and they 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 wouldn't do it, and uh, I don't know why. And then and then and, and then so we switched to Scorsese and Spielberg, and they were just automatic. So. Um, uh, we, we are, uh, the film is going into theatrical release uh, after Thanksgiving, and so it's going, it's starting in New York and Los Angeles and Boston and, and uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and so hopefully it does well there here, it should be, should be here too, so watch for it uh, early 2017. All right, well thank you, Tara, thank you. Thank you.